It's cold. It's very cold. But I don't care because underneath me is the Princess S72 and it's one of those boats that appears to defy physics. It's over 75 feet long. It's 50 tonnes, pretty much. It's got four very luxurious cabins downstairs. But when you open the throttles and give it some, it'll do this. That was from 25 knots, and it feels like it leaps again up onto the plane. And the reason it's doing that is because we've got two 1800 horsepower V12 diesel engines down in the engine room that earlier on, with a little bit of tide up our bottom, took us to over 40 knots. It's a 75 foot flybridge boat, 40 knots. Absolutely ludicrous. And it's not just the performance, it's the handling as well. Something this big should not be able to do this. Okay, there are a few turns locked to lock to get it to do it, but that doesn't really matter because the way this thing shifts beneath you, given its size, is utterly remarkable. It's actually based on the Y72, but it's like the Y72 has been lifting some tin in the gym, getting a bit more slender, a bit more agile bit more muscular they've also given it more power and in this video i'm going to tell you a lot more about what this thing is like to drive i'm also going to show you all the deck spaces in the interior and at the end i'm going to talk to you about pricing and also tell you which extras i think you need to make the perfect princess s72 i'm jack haynes you're watching your bike And before I forget, if you enjoy our sea trial content, remember to subscribe to the Yacht Buyer channel, hit subscribe, hit the bell icon, and you'll be notified every single time one goes live. All right, let's settle down a little bit now, because the nice thing about having a 40 knot top speed on something this big is when you throttle back to 25 knots, which I'm doing now, it just feels laughably slow. Well, I can actually barely believe we're doing 25 knots at the moment. It feels like you're doing about 10 knots, but that's the beauty of it. You can tear around your hair on fire on this thing if you really want to, but this 25 knot cruise, if you just want to cover some distance, you know, that sort of long, lazy cruising speed, this is absolutely lovely. And it feels so quiet and refined in comparison. And you're doing 160 litres per hour per engine, which, so given the size of those things down there, really isn't too bad going, I don't think. It's a fantastic driving position up here as well. You're not quite on the centre line, but you're, you're pretty central, and there's space between this seat and the navigator so that they can get in and out without disturbing you. But this is a really nice, comfortable position where I can lean back because there's adjustment on the seat. I can see the bow really easily, and I have the dash laid out perfectly in front of me. Of course, these days it's all digitised, got rain marines either side, the bonding system in the middle, which you get at both helms, and that gives you full digital switching, full control of absolutely everything on board. And then of course you have your physical controls down here. But it's nice that, yes, you feel really engaged with the boat when you're traveling at those higher speeds, but if you just want to relax and chill at 25 knots, well, this is a fantastic place to do it. But, but, I, but I must reiterate, it will never get boring burying the throttles at 25 knots and it jumping up onto the plane like a 40-foot sports boat. It is just ridiculous how quickly this thing gathers pace. Those engines just power on the power, the performance. And we're, we're at 38 knots so easily. And the handling, it's just ridiculous. It is so agile. They could do with sharpening up the steering a little bit. It's a shame that it takes so much lock to get it to do this, but it will do this. Yeah, it's something else. It really is. This S-Class range that puts performance slightly above where performance might be in the Y-Class range. You know, you, you could cruise at 35 knots in this. Absolutely no problem. We really could, but we have to turn up wind now, which in minus two is going to be very unpleasant. Thankfully, we've got that lovely lower home downstairs. So let's go and see what it's like to drive from down there. 
I guess the most striking thing down here compared to upstairs is just how quiet it is. We're doing that same 24, 25 knot cruising speed that we we're doing up there. Where up there you're being obviously bombarded by the wind and you can hear the sea. You're so well insulated, not only from the environment here, but also the engines. Remember, there's you know three and a half thousand horsepower churning away back there. But at this cruising speed, we are looking at sound levels of, well, I'm quiet for a second, 73. 74 decibels remarkable really considering the power that this thing's got and I, I think they put a lot of focus into making the person at the helm very comfortable these seats are, are really really good it's a bit lazy to say that they look like bentley seats but they, they really do and they feel very high quality but they're also massively comfortable and you feel like you can sit in these for a long period of time if you're doing long passages and and remain comfortable there's plenty of adjustment as well they slide back and forth they slide back far enough that you can stand at the helm if you want to and of course you've got two of them as well so you've got a bit of company up here things are a little bit further away on the helm than they are upstairs but you have got the remote control down here for the Raymarine MFD so you don't have to use the touch screens you can flick between the screens using this so you, you know you can stay in the seat a bit more and like upstairs you've got the bonding screen as well so again all your digital switching is underneath your hand here effectively and you've got engine information all sorts of information is contained through that bonding screen so your ventilation is excellent because we've got a side door here, we've got a window that side. Of course you've got the sunroof overhead so on warmer days you can ventilate this area however you want and there are good ways for you to be able to communicate with the crew if you are using this to, to manoeuvre the boat at slow speeds. And of course if you up the speed, ooh, <laughs> there's that, that nice little punch that I was talking about upstairs. Okay you feel it a bit more down here but even at the very top end, pouring along at you know nearly 40 knots, Sound levels are still only just over 75 decibels. We're going up into the very slight chop we've got at the moment. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty remarkable. And then again, it, it just enhances, once you drop down to that slow cruising speed, how quiet and comfortable it is. They've done a great job with the insulation on this boat, that's for sure. It's a really, really nice place to, to drive the boat from. And you know, you can cover some ground on this thing. It's got four and a half thousand litre fuel capacity. So if you're not tearing around at 40 knots, you get about 350 nautical miles out of it. If you drop down to displacement speed, you're probably looking at more like 1,000 nautical miles, if not a bit more. So you've got massive variety in that cruising band from 1,000 nautical miles to, to 40 knots and probably a couple of hundred nautical miles. But it is an impressive, impressive cruising machine. It really is. One of the major differences between the Y-Class and the S-Class range is that you get a tender garage. What that means is you can fit a decent sized tender in here, 3.9 metres, there's a Williams in this one, and obviously it keeps the bathing platform completely clear. It maintains the really lovely styling, that sleek profile that they're really trying to achieve with the S-Class range and the S72. But you can also have chocks back here on the bathing platform. This is a hydraulic bathing platform as well, so you can have a jet ski or another water toy back here. And obviously that's a very nice way to get in and out of the water as well. It drops down, you can get in and out very easily if you're swimming, and it combines very nicely with the garage. But ultimately it means that this is just a lovely, clear space. And there's some nice detailing back here as well. The Princess logo is so simple these days. They used to write the name out on the side of the boats, and now you just get the, get the crown, and this is dotted all over the place. And it's nice, you step on the boat, you know immediately, ah, I'm on board a princess. Up into the cockpit. There's a crew cabin in here, we're gonna have a look at that later on. And if you have the passerelle fitted, it's on this side, it's underneath this piece of deck and the controls are down here. Obviously, if you're on the Mediterranean, anywhere where you're berthing stern to, you're probably gonna to want to have that fitted. Now here in the cockpit, it doesn't feel quite as spacious as its main rivals, the likes of the Predator 75 from Sunseeker and the Azimut S7. It, it is physically smaller, certainly compared to the Sunseeker. If you want pure seating space, that is probably the boat to go for but what is nice is you have this really good overhang which often you don't get on sports bridge boats so this area often feels a lot more exposed here you're well protected from the sun and it just feels a bit more enclosed a bit safer you've still got a decent amount of seating you can see this nice wrap here and what's quite clever is these two outer sections are pinned into the deck but you can undo those pins and you can slide these wherever you want in this area so if you want people sitting opposite you if you want to sit with your feet up and look out to sea, then you can move these end bits and you can do that. I think that's a really clever bit of functionality. Table sort of speaks for itself, but again, you've got the nice princess detailing. We've got your finger holds, cup holders when the table is folded up, 
and then obviously it folds out to make it twice as large. And I talk about seating. The benefit of this arrangement on the Sunseeker, for example, the seating is all biased onto the starboard side, but you have got equal access down both sides here. So it's very easy to get up and down from the bathing platform, whichever side of the boat you're going. Over on this side, you have this unit here. They have actually put a cooler down on this side. It's a little bit awkward to get to because it's underneath the steps, but it's somewhere else. It's drained out. You can chuck drinks in there, wet kit, whatever. It's just, you know, another bit of useful space that ordinarily you wouldn't have. On this side, you actually have a proper draw fridge. This is an option. It's quite a nice option. Just means you don't have to go too far to get food and drink. But if you do want more seating, you can replace this with a little L-shaped seating area here, which gives you somewhere else to sit. And obviously, a nice perspective out over the back of the boat. Now, another option down here is you can have a third control station. This boat is spec'd for the med, hence why you've got the passerelle, and they're going to be doing a lot of stern two berthing probably. So you have another control station down here with the throttles and the thrusters, so you can drive the boat from here and look where you're going out the back of the boat. Let's look to the foredeck. <laughs> There's not a huge amount to mention about the side decks, apart from the fact that they're nice and wide and they feel very safe. There's no boarding gates, but you have got two nice big cleats down there and it's an easy and safe boat to move around on really. And they're up to the foredeck and as with most sports bridges, this area suddenly becomes more important because that bit up there is smaller than a normal flybridge and they've done a nice job with it. You've got the usual sofa underneath the windscreen, the optional table down here so you can line your drinks up and let's be honest, put your mobile phones down. And then you have these sun pads here which have got lift up backrests at this end so you can lift them up and look forward. You want to be a bit more comfortable and not lie completely flat and I believe there is the option, which this boat doesn't have, to have this end fold as well. So these two pieces at this forward end can fold up this way so you can lie and face into the boat a bit more comfortably. In between, you've just got a really useful locker actually where you can store stuff, chuck valuables in there, and you know they're not gonna blow away or slide around if the boat starts to move when you're up here. And then right forward, of course, this is also your working area. So you've got twin anchor lockers, one's quite shallow, and that's got the control in it. And then this one here is really, really deep, really good for fender storage, lots of space for your chain down there, but it's all neatly separated off and really well put together. And I also like the way that they've incorporated the fair leads into the bulwarks here. I think that looks really, really nice. Big storage bins here as well, shouldn't forget those. And they really are big. There's a lot of big fenders on this boat and you can get the majority of them into these two lockers on either side. They're really well located, nice and deep, really sensible stuff. And before we head inside, let's go up to the final deck space, which of course is the flybridge. It's really easy to get up to the flybridge. They've got these sort of floating steps, so they're quite subtly integrated down here. There's not big mouldings getting in the way, but it is a nice shallow staircase and very easy to get up here to the top deck. And I think this is where sports bridges hit a really interesting point because we're a 72, 73 foot boat, you are getting a good sized flybridge. Okay, it's nowhere near as big as the Y72s, but it's still a really decent living space up here where you have everything you want to serve guests on this level. So yes, you have your enormous seating area back here, very similar table to downstairs. It's bigger, but it still folds and opens out. But you've just got lovely wrap of seating here. And then they've done something quite clever, I think, and put the wet bar in that back corner there. Again, could just be wasted space, no, no, that's where your grill is. They've got some storage under there, space over here for the fridge, sinks over there as well. So it's really nicely arranged around this area. And as an option, you can have an awning that pops out the back of the hardtop. Now the hardtop's an interesting one. This is such a good looking boat. Personally, I think it looks better without the hardtop. You can have a hydraulic bimini if you prefer, and that's got lighting in it. Comes up and down at the touch of a button. But a lot of people just like this fixed hardtop. They like the way it looks, they like the protection. It hasn't got a sunroof, so you haven't got the flexibility of the Bimini, and it's more expensive. It's totally personal. I think I'd personally go for the Bimini, but it's a neat little job they've done with this hardtop. Here you have a nice seating area. Obviously, you've got your two helm seats over here, but you've got more seating here so that more people can sit and face forward and enjoy the journey. And I imagine a boat like this, when you're charging along at 35 knots, people will want to come and enjoy the ride from up here on a nice warm day. And they've upholstered this area as well, so you can just sort of perch and lean. And again, just use it. It's not just a blank piece of fiberglass, it's cushioned off, makes more of an area. It's just really clever little design touches that you see all over this thing. Right, can we now please go inside because it is absolutely freezing.
Oh, it's much nicer in here. I can tell you for one thing, the heating definitely works, and this boat's got the optional 162,000 BTU reverse cycle air conditioning, so you'll be able to use that when it's a little bit warmer. But for now, yeah, it's lovely and touchy in here. Very, very welcome environment. And the other thing you have is this little pop-up window here, which I'm gonna close immediately because it's so cold, but that means, obviously, when you have everything open, you have that open, you have this nice connection between the galley area here and the cockpit. But do come on in because it's, it's really warm and, and cozy, not only the temperature, but also the decor in here. It's very, very inviting. I'm gonna use the old cliche, it's typical princess, but it is. They just do such a nice job of this stuff. The soft curves, the use of wood, colors, and there's some lovely little touches as we move further into the saloon. But let's start here with the galley. I've mentioned how well it connects to that cockpit there, and, that, and it definitely does, but it is also open to the rest of the saloon. So it's very sociable. If you're cooking on this boat, preparing food, you're not out of the action in any way. It all fits together very, very nicely. And it's not huge, but the space that is here has been used really well. So you've got nice clear counter up here, and over here, but of course you've got all of the appliances that you'd expect to have, including things like dishwasher here, you've got your induction cooking here, oven down here, and domestic fridge and freezer over on this side, and they've even managed to fit an ice maker down here underneath the bar section here. That's a, a, a nice bit of packaging down there. And I talked about the detailing, well, I love this. This is your chopping board, obviously, it's also your sink cover, but they have thought about where it might go when you're not using it. And there's a lovely little slot down here that it can slide away into. I'm a boring man, that sort of thing really pleases me. It's pathetic, but there you go. What else? You've got extraction here as well. You've got decent view from here as well. You've got a nice bit of glazing over the cooktop here, but then the views over the other side, the windows in this area are superb. It, it is great. Even when you're inside in a cold day like this, you still feel you have that connection to the outside. Opposite the galley, you have your internal dining space. And as the table's outside, you can either have it in this sort of half arrangement where you've got, again, a handhold and some cup holders, or again, you find your finger slot and open it up and you've got a really nice big table here. And there's some clever stuff down here. And underneath this bench is actually where you find your crockery, but it may not be in the galley, but it's all in one place. It's all neatly fiddled and it's all on soft closed runners as well. Very, very nicely done. And I mentioned again, just seeing these nice soft corners over the place. So if you bash into these when you're at sea, you don't get a horrible dig in the side if you do so. I really like this living area on the S72. This is where the size of those windows really hits you. It's lovely and bright here, and your views out, stood up or sitting down are really good. The only thing it hasn't got enough of, I don't think, is scatter cushions. But you can always add those, of course, if you, if you don't think you've got enough. But there is a huge amount of seating here, and this is my favorite seat on the boat. Don't you just want to uh, collapse into that and enjoy the view? I just need a drink in one hand, but this is such a great spot. And I love the way that it's been so well integrated into this dresser over here. And it's next to the TV, which pops up from behind here. You've got a wine fridge down here as well, and more storage over on this side. Small coffee table on this boat. I imagine you have a bigger, more substantial one if you want, but this is a coffee table, it's to arrange drinks on. If you're gonna eat, you're gonna be sitting over there. And over to another favorite spot of this interior. It's, it's like on the flybridge, you've got somewhere else that guests can come, sit forward. You're elevated here, so you've got a great view out. You can see forward just as well as you can from the helm. It's a really comfortable space. It's underneath the sunroof. You've got the control here for the electric window that's behind me. And if you do want somewhere to work, you can pop this out, put the laptop over here, and what a place to fire off a few emails. I think that's a really, really cool touch. And here we come to one of the most important bits of design of the sports bridge. You get the sunroof as well. You've got the flybridge up there, but you also get this really big sunroof, three big panes of glass inside it. So even when it's closed like it is now, you're still getting the benefit of all that natural light. Of course, on a nice warm day, open it up. You have the sights and the sounds of your surroundings. It's a really lovely feature. That sort of best of both worlds feel it is the real benefit of having the sports bridge. Let's head downstairs now though and check out the guest accommodation. It's down here on the lower deck where the S72 is identical to the Y72 and that means we have three guest cabins forward here. On the starboard side here we have a twin and this has the option to have the sliding berth so you can have twins or a double. 
Over here on the port side, very similar in terms of the cabin space. And this also has a signing berth. You can have that on neither cabin. You can have it on both, you can have it on one. Gives you a lot of flexibility though if both cabins can slide and transform between twins and doubles. What else you got in here? Well, head food is very good. I'm six foot and I've got plenty of space above my head. And look at these access panels. It's a bit dull, but it's quite important. You pop that and you have access to wiring, lighting, that sort of thing. There's no pulling down panels, anything like that. They make it very easy for you to get to those spaces. Storage is good in these cabins. Nice big hang locker here. See there's a decent amount of room in there. And both sets of berths have got drawers underneath as well. So storage is pretty good for a cabin of this size. And the nice thing about this guest cabin is that through this door here, you have direct access to the day head. And it's a nice day head, I mean, it's big. See, I've got plenty of space to move around in here. Separate shower cubicle with really good headroom and its own window. And I think this is the first time I've seen this black bathroom wear on a princess. I think it looks really, really good. I imagine you could just have chrome if you prefer, but I think that looks really smart and very, very modern. And if we move right forward, not forgetting that in this hallway, you have access to a washer and a dryer in their own separate compartments, we have the VIP. This is a good space. You'd expect this to be a luxurious cabin, but on a boat of this size, you do get a nice amount of floor space. You don't feel too cramped. There's loads of space either side of the bed as well, so it's very easy to get in and out of this nice big double berth. You've no skylight overhead. You've got an escape hatch, but no skylight. But you have got decent chunks of hull window on either side, so natural light is okay, but the artificial lighting is so well done throughout this boat. I didn't actually mention it in the saloon, but the way that the lighting connects from outside to inside in there is lovely. And down here, you've got really subtle, but very bright spotlights, nice under lighting as well. So you can set the mood in here very, very easily. Big storage in this. You've got an even bigger hanging wardrobe in this boat. You've got a little bureau over on this side, big TV in this cabin as well. And this cabin has its own private ensuite. But as you may well be picking up, we're on anchor at the moment, there's a bit of water running under the hull. If this was nighttime, it'd be a bit of a disturbance, which is why the owner's cabin is a midships. So let's go there. Well, another great thing this boat shares with the Y72 is this separate access, private access to the owner's cabin. That gives you that lovely staircase, lovely curving staircase down into this area. And it's a big boat, there's no excuse for not using every bit of space for storage. And they've done that, even behind the staircase, they've got wine bottle storage neatly integrated into that area. And you've got a big laundry cupboard in the lobby outside this cabin as well. It's, it's so well thought out, this boat, it really is. And this cabin, well, this really is quite something. It is it's a beautiful space, this. It's very, very spacious. Headroom is clearly very good. Totally flat floor all the way around. Really nice, big king size bed here. And then a lovely split of the sofa over on that side, the bureau over on this side, but I just love all this detailing here, this shelving here with these bars here to keep everything in place. Again, there's curvature, curvature, curvature all over the place. And it feels like it carries on from the saloon. It's, it works really well in this sleeping space though, as well. Bureau here, this little pop-up mirror, somewhere to put jewelry and makeup. And then down here on either side of the bed, you've got your switch panel for lighting, so you can control all the lighting in this cabin from the comfort of your bed, but crucially, also the blinds. You can drop your blinds on both sides, and I should say it's actually electric blinds throughout. So up in the saloon as well, you have a row of buttons, you can put the blinds up and down at the touch of the button, rather than having to put them up manually. It's a really nice touch, and it means when you get up in the morning, you can push your button. It's one touch as well, it's always nice. And up goes the curtain, and you're met with this wonderful, if slightly choppy today, view out over the water. But I must mention these hull windows because we get quite sort of blasé about them. These ones are massive and they're lovely, unbroken, and they really do deliver lovely views out over the water from bed as well. They're set at the right height. So if you're lying in bed, you've got a great view out. You've also got a great view of your whacking great television over there on that bulkhead. And I keep talking about detailing, I'm sorry, I know I'm a bit of a bore, but it is just lovely and it is what sets princess interiors apart. The thought that has gone into this area alone, the different materials, the use of fabric and wood. You see the backlighting here that at night shoots light up these areas? It's really, really lovely stuff. And the space is so impressive because if I come back here, you have a, a dressing room almost. It can't be closed off, but you have got another sort of preparation area here, more drawer storage down here and then big hanging storage over on this side and then we head into the bathroom it's another absolute whopper it's almost the full beam of the boat it would be if you didn't have that dressing area over there but there's still enough space in here for 
a pair of sinks, lots and lots of storage underneath. And again, we've got the, the black bathroom wear here. Again, I think it looks really nice, a bit more masculine, but uh, yeah, it adds a bit of modernity to this area. Not so much sort of high gloss and chrome on this one. A little, same with the hooks up here and even the towel rails, all nice sort of black powder coated, looks, looks lovely. And would you look at this shower cubicle? It's massive. Look how much space I've got in here. Rain shower head overhead. And how about this for a view out in a nice manual porthole so you can poke your head out and feel the ice cold breeze on a warm day. That might be a bit more attractive, but always nice to have some natural ventilation in there like this so you can get rid of the steam really, really easily. The blowers are doing their thing down here, so it's a bit noisy, apologies for that, but I've got to show you the machinery space because it's a really strong part of the S72. Space in here is really impressive. You can get an idea of how much headroom there is in here. And you also why it's so quiet, because there is just lashings and lashings of soundproofing down here. If there's a surface that it could be applied to, they have applied it. But big old motors in here and still a decent amount of space to move around. Certainly down the middle, certainly to do your day-to-day -day checks a bit trickier to get outboard of the engines, but they've done quite a clever thing in compartmentalizing this space because the generator is down in their sort of anti-room over there, which you access via another hatch towards the bathing platform. They haven't tried to cram everything into this space. Yes, you've got your air conditioning units up here, but actually the bits in here are easy to get to and it doesn't feel too compromised. And the fact you've got a tender garage and there's so little intrusion is another massive benefit. You can just see the front of it poking into the engine room there, but it doesn't impede on the space at all, really. And everything is very neat, very tidy, very easy to follow where lines go, cables, plumbing, that sort of thing. It's a really well-engineered space. This boat is probably less likely to have crew than the Y70 on which it's based. And obviously the tender garage does gobble into this area a little bit. So it is a bit more compromised than that boat. That said, you've still got two berths. Headroom isn't amazing. The berths themselves are okay. And you've got you know, some, some simple living arrangements down here. Like you have got a bathroom down here, not finished the same standard as the rest of the interior, but the space is okay. As I said, this style of boat, probably more likely to be owner run anyway. If you do want occasional crew, this space will certainly suffice. Now I think it's time to fire up, head back in and see what she's like to handle around the marina. Now we haven't got joystick control on this S72, though if you want a joystick on this type of boat, I'd probably go for the Azima S7 because that's a triple IPS boat where you have totally seamless joystick integration. So if you're after that, then that's probably the one to go for. However, this boat is incredibly maneuverable. The fact that it's got twin shafts and the variable speed bow and stern thrusters does mean that it reacts very nicely at these slow speeds. I mean, there's a huge amount of bite from these props. If you're in gear on both engines, just in gear, you're gonna be doing about seven knots. So, you know, there's plenty of grunt at slow speeds. So if you need to make little adjustments, you can just snick these gear levers in and out of gear and the boat does turn really obediently. And then of course, if you want a little bit more room for a bit more instantaneous, you've got these fantastic thrusters, bow and stern in this case, and they also have a hold function. So if you want to pin the boat to the pontoon and, and get off and do lines or anything like that, or just know that the boat is being held in place, you can do that. In terms of the view from up here, well, this is a great place to, to do these maneuvers from. I've obviously got a fantastic view forward. I can see the bathing platform through the deck catch here on the flybridge. Of course, the lower helm as well, you've got Really good access because you have the, the side door, so communication is good. But as I said earlier on, if you're going to be doing things going stern to, you're probably going to want to use the optional third station down the cockpit. But essentially, it's big, but it's an easy boat to manoeuvre around a marina. Let's talk about pricing, shall we? Now, at the time of recording, the base price of an S72 with 1,800 horsepower engines, XV80 in the UK was three and a half million pounds. This boat to spec with V80 is about 5.2 million pounds. And of course, there's a lot of subjective stuff about what you might actually want fitted to your particular boat if you're gonna buy one of these, but I think there are some options that every boat should have to make them as good as possible. And those would include things like the gyroscopic stabilizer. It's 100,000 pounds, more than 100,000 pounds actually as an option, but it's gonna improve life on board so much. And I think it's one of those things that people will be looking at in the second hand market, if you're gonna put this on the market, that they'll really 
really want to see. So it probably is worth the investment. I talked about the heart up earlier on. Personally, I wouldn't have it, but I'm the opposite to the market in that case. Most people do want to see these. And again, it's one of those things that a secondhand buyer may want to see. Personally, I think the Hydraulic Vimini is better because it keeps the profile of the boat looking nicer and also it's got more functionality. Other things you may want. The sunroof is an option. I would definitely have that. Part of the point of having a sports bridge is that you get the sunroof as well, so I'd definitely add that to the list. Teak side decks, again, that's an option. Same on the fore deck, I'd have that. I think it brightens up the air, it makes it feel more luxurious and just adds to that feeling of class on board the boat. So I'd certainly go for that. Other items are probably slightly dependent on where you keep the boat. If you're gonna be keeping it in the Mediterranean, warmer climes, obviously air conditioning comes into the equation. And again, if stern two berthing is something you're doing very often, you're gonna want that passerelle as well. But that's the spec for me. Let me know if you think I've missed anything off there, anything major that you'd add to this boat to make your perfect spec. And also tell me which you'd have out of this, the Sunsea compared to 75 and the Azimut S7. Thanks very much for watching that video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give the video a like. And I think this is the best model currently in the Princess S-Class range. But if you disagree with that, let me know why in the comments below. And if you really like your Princess content, I compared the X95 to the Y95 in a video a while ago. That's already on the channel. You can watch that if you click up here. If you'd like some more sea trials, you can click down here. And if you'd like to subscribe, you can click up here. Thanks again for watching. I'm Jack Haynes. This is Your Buyer.